1687, a man was transferred to a prison on this island here off the south coast of France. A man who had spent the previous four decades behind bars wearing an iron mask. He is, without doubt, the most famous prisoner in French history. But who was he? Although Dumas actually referred to the man in the iron mask as a fictional figure in one of his novels, I genuinely do believe there was a real historical figure, and there really was a man in the iron mask. He was kept in a cell that only allowed access through multiple tiers of gates, so nobody could ever hear what he was talking about, because this was a scandal that King Louis XIV couldn't let out. The identity of the man in the iron mask is one of the greatest mysteries of history. Nobody was supposed to know who he was or why he was there for that matter, which his identification would have indicated. Why would he be both looked after and kept in a mask? And that surely must be that he was instantly recognizable. Why would they want to conceal his identity? What would be the purpose of that? And the reasonable conclusion would be to hide his identity because he looked like the king, possibly even his twin brother. November the 19th, 1703, a tomb in the Bastille's St. Paul Cemetery welcomed the corpse of a man who had spent the last four decades of his life behind bars. He is without doubt the most famous prisoner in French history. But who was he? What was his crime? And why was he kept in near isolation with his face covered by an infamous iron mask? This man must have been someone uh, very well known or looked very much like someone else or had one hell of a secret that they didn't want anyone to know about but for someone to endure for a few hours a, a, a mask that was actually riveted onto your onto your head with with a, a mouthpiece that opened um, to endure this for 32 years it, it's un unbelievable that someone could survive all we can say with any certainty about the alleged man in the iron mask is that he was a chap who was imprisoned in many prisons across France and who was confined to what we would call solitary confinement, but yet was treated really well. So what's curious is that there's no one who's ever been recorded as having seen his face. So we're not sure who he was. The evidence becomes particularly interesting when in 1789, in the course of the French Revolution, the Bastille is overrun, and among the mysterious things it contains is a skeleton wearing an iron mask. Now, the source that made this prisoner world famous is a story by Alexandre Dumas called The Man in the Iron Mask, which he wrote at this very desk. Now, although this is a work of fiction, it does contain some very important historical data, and the author spent a lot of time at researching the history behind the story. Now, according to Dumas, the prisoner was none other than the twin of Louis XIV, and being only a few minutes older made him the legitimate heir to the throne. Now, the king threw his brother into prison clad his face with an iron mask so no one would ever notice the resemblance. Alexander Dumas's theory is that it was the twin brother of King Louis XIV of France. Uh, and of course, you can't have two kings. So what better than put one in an iron mask and put him away? He was the twin of King Louis XIV and as the king was aspiring to the throne, he realized that this wasn't going to happen for him. So he got rid of him. He imprisoned him. But, of course, it's his brother. So he's going to treat him very well, which, in fact, the man in the Iron Mask was. So that theory actually is relatively plausible. Obviously, the person in the mask 
if without the mask would be instantly recognizable. Um, and the only person who would be instantly recognizable in those days was the king. Alexander Dumas was known for brilliantly mixing fact with fiction. So I think we can definitely make the conclusion that the man in the iron mask was indeed the twin brother of Louis XIV. Another theory as to the identity of the man in the Iron Mask is that he wasn't the twin of Louis XIV, but in fact, his father. Now, Louis XIII was considered too old to squire an heir, and an heir was desperately needed, otherwise his scheming brother would ascend to the throne. So it's believed that Cardinal Richelieu, the king's closest ally and spymaster, instructed one of his musketeers to sleep with the queen and produce an heir, which she did. However, it's said that years later, the musketeer, down on his luck and broke, tried to extort money from the king and Richelieu, threatening to blow the affair wide open. At which point, the king threw the musketeer into prison, clamped an iron mask on his face, and thus the legend of the man in the iron mask was born. The old king, Louis XIII, was allegedly impotent and had been for some time when the boy destined to become Louis XIV was born. It had also been commented that the strong, vigorous young prince was nothing like his sick, ailing, invalid father. Now, one of the theories was that on the machinations of uh, certain very highly placed people in the French court. Um, the, the queen was impregnated by a vigorous young guardsman who worked for one of those same uh, very highly placed courtiers and that uh, he was then imprisoned so that the uh, thing could not ever be known. Basically, uh, the, the real father of Louis the Fourteenth was making a fuss about this, perhaps demanding a lot of money, power, titles, whatever, um, and that he was getting a little out of hand with this, and so he had to be dealt with. Of course, the other possibility that most people think, mm, yeah, in those days, and certainly Richelieu, would go along with the idea of, of basically just shooting him in the head, and then there'd be no more demands. So it doesn't seem very likely. The reason I think this story has captivated people's imagination for a couple hundred years now is the fact that, one, it remains unsolved. Two, you have this almost heroic figure who is somehow regal because he's treated very well. What did he know? Why wasn't he killed? And isn't it sad that he has to live a life of solitary confinement? So there's a bit of romance and a bit of mystery associated with it. And of course, it's been played up in the media for, for decades in films, so it's quite popular and well-known, and I don't see it dying out anytime soon. My next stop was to meet Jean-Christophe Petitfi, one of the most well-respected historians in France. He's an expert on the works of Alexandre Dumas, and believed that the story of the man in the iron mask is based on a real man who spent most of his life in prison. And to cap it off, he even has a theory on who that really was. Was the, uh, the man in the iron mask a real historical figure? Oui, l'homme au masque de fer a vraiment existé. Il y a d'un côté une légende qui a pris son essor au 18e siècle. Et puis, il y a une réalité d'un prisonnier français sous le règne de Louis XIV qui a porté un masque de fer, un masque d'acier même. Mais ce personnage a existé. Et donc, c'est un grand mystère de l'histoire de France. Quelle est l'identité de cet homme So who do you think he was la, la, la thèse de Dumas dans le Vicomte de Bragelonne, c'est de dire que l'homme au masque de fer était le frère jumeau de Louis XIV. Donc, ce qui posait un, un grave problème pour euh, euh, le trône. Qui peut occuper le trône quand euh, un roi a, a deux, deux fils euh, jumeaux euh, Grave problème, la question ne s'était jamais posée 
dans l'histoire de France. Et là, donc, d'après Dumas, elle se pose. Et que faire de celui qui ne va pas régner Donc, euh, celui qui ne va pas régner, eh bien, on, on est obligé de le mettre à l'écart, euh, donc de l'emprisonner et de lui mettre un masque pour que personne ne le reconnaisse. There's very little documentary evidence to help us unravel this mystery. Presumably because the men behind it wanted all trace of this prisoner and his incarceration destroyed. But Jean-Christophe has published in his book on the subject an original letter which actually talks about the imprisonment of a man who wore an iron mask. It would seem that Dumas' story was in fact based on a real person. So what is this document? Oh, this is a very important document, the first one uh, where the, it's mentioned the uh, name of the prisoner, the prisoner with an iron mask. So this, this is, is evidence that the, the, there was a prisoner who wore an iron mask. Exactly, this is the evidence exactly, to prove that. Exactly. So what does it say? What is it? Uh, it says the, uh, the arrival of uh, this prisoner at the prison of Sainte Marguerite with a uh, mask of steel or iron mask uh, on, the, on this uh, His face. face. Yeah. Okay, and this t t details what? Well, this was a movement. The prison was moved from one prison. Uh, the prison was moved from exile to uh, Sainte Marguerite, uh, which is uh, near Cannes. So this is hard evidence that he really existed. Yes, it is a proof uh, uh, of his existence. The fact that the story of the man in the iron mask became so intriguing but so quickly shows that it was out of the ordinary at a time when people did, political prisoners certainly did just disappear into the system. Day by day, night upon night, the prisoner prays for some way to... So I've come to the village of Langres, which is about three hours southeast of Paris. And in this museum, they claim to have the mask that the prisoner actually wore, which is pretty amazing. So uh, let's go and take a look. Unbelievably, the mask was discovered at a street market at the end of the 19th century, before changing hands several times and ending up in this museum. It's not on show to the public, so the curator, Olivier Comon, arranged to have it brought up from the archives to show me. It's important for the conversation. So, yes. the mask. The mask. Merci. Can I hold him? Yes, please. So perhaps a real mask. So this is the actual mask? Yes, the mask of Iran. And you believe this to be the...? I don't know. It's very difficult to say it's a real mask. He, he, he was discovered by a scrap, a scrap dealer uh, in the town of Long in 1895. And this is a woman, it was a woman, uh, buy the mask to an antiquarian. And the antiquarian, after, give the mask to the museum. Okay. And um, what do we think these holes are for? Is this to attach the mask on the... Yes, thing? yes, certainly. You have here, 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 and in the bus. Yeah. And was there any inscription on the mask when it was found? Yes, or? yes. The history, we know that during the 19th century, we have a little uh, paper label inside the mask, who is lost today, unfortunately. But we have, we know the inscription uh, on this label. And the inscription was in 1703, the deeds take off this mask from the face of the twin brother of the King Louis XIV. 
So it's very important yeah. to think that it's perhaps the real mask of iron. Wow, that's extraordinary. And what is this? This hole here looks like yes, a, yes, like a keyhole. Yes, it's a little keyhole. Uh, so, which would suggest that it might have been locked yes, yes, at some it's stage. Certainly, to lock the mask on the face. So that yes. would suggest that maybe the mask would have been used to would have been a lockable mask. Yes. So we don't know that this is the mask, yes. but it's still an extraordinary thing. Yes, yes, and it's very rare. It's very rare to find a mask from, um, perhaps from medieval period, but more, more probably for 17th or 18th century. We can't be sure then that this was the, the actual mask. That it's the... impossible to say the true about the mask. Sure. Perhaps it's a real mask from uh, the brother of the king or from uh, another person, another people. But it's still an extraordinary thing, isn't it? It's quite a thing to actually hold in your hands a real piece of French history. And what could be the actual iron mask worn by the infamous prisoner? But the question still remain, who was he? And what crime had he committed to deserve this fate? The mask that's in the museum in Long is really interesting because it is sort of an androgynous looking part of a mask. But is it the mask that the man in the iron mask would have worn? I'm not so sure. It could be part of it, because the front piece is is there, but there's no just going to cover his face and his eyes. It's not going to cover his hair or his head or the side of his face. So it doesn't seem like that was enough to hide the identity of a truly important man. Well, we have no really conclusive evidence about the mask that's turned up. And masks turn up quite often in, in flea markets across France but there's really no viable evidence to prove that this mask actually is the actual one that was used for the man in the iron mask. Doesn't ring true to me. It, it's got eye holes, it's, it's got a mouth, um, but it's only more like a death mask than anything else. Nothing at the back. And the original mask was supposed to have been riveted to this guy so it could never come off. And that's back and front. And this is not what you see in that museum. Truth is, it's very unusual for a prisoner to be wearing an iron mask. I mean, think about prisons in that day and age. They were nasty places. People are insane. They're trying to escape. They're, they're behaving. They're down in a dungeon somewhere. You know, they're not masked. They, you know, they're, they're, they're barely clothed. So here you have a man of a quite regal status who has an iron mask on at all times. That really would have stood out. That was not usual or normal at all. It was said that the man in the iron mask was kept in solitary confinement for most of his life, and he wasn't allowed to come into contact with anyone but a select few, including his musketeer guards. And if he ever dared to speak of anything other than his immediate needs, they had strict orders to execute him immediately. Unusually, he also had the same jailer for the whole of his life behind bars. The French prison warden, Benin Dauvin de Saint Mars. What's really interesting about the man in the iron mask is his jailer, who is a very ambitious man who rises through the ranks and asks to be associated to look after the man in the iron mask. And sure enough, they're together for 34 years. Could you imagine the relationship? And it almost seems as though, it certainly seems as though he understands, his jailer does, that this is an important individual, maybe a, a royal individual, or somebody who knows something so fantastic that they cannot be killed. His jailer, Benign de Verne, um, actually took on a, an extra title of Saint Mars, which, which to a certain extent seems to make him think that he was he was special. And he actually took on looking after this possibly royal prisoner for, for the rest of his life. 
um, from four different prisons for 32 years. And, and to be quite honest with you, he looked after him so well that he has actually been um, heard actually calling him my prince. St. Mers, who was the jailer of the man in the Iron Mask from the first incarceration all the way through the other prisons and finally to the Bastille itself, was a very ambitious man. And had there been an opportunity for him to be promoted and to be well treated by Louis XIV in return for his total trustworthiness and his total secrecy, then St. Mars was the kind of man who would have done that. There is a lot of evidence that the governor of the prisons that the man in the mask was in um, treated him with almost with deference, almost with a slight element of awe, um, that this person was a person of some status. Um, the stories, for example, of other prisoners and, you know, doffing their caps and calling him my prince. Of course, it could have been um, sarcastic, um, but taken together with everything else and the way he was treated by the governor, then it probably wasn't sarcastic. Uh, he probably was a person of status. In 1687, the man in the Iron Mask was transferred to a remote island off the coast of Cannes in southern France to a prison known as Fort Royal. According to reports, a special cell block was constructed just for him to keep him in total isolation, which is still accessible today. I'd arranged to meet local historian Christophe Roustin de la Tour, who agreed to show me around. Ah, Christophe. Bonjour. Hi. 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 Thank you. Thank you. So this was once a fort, is that right? Yeah, it's a, it's a fort uh, standing on the uh, border of, uh, of France in those days. So there wasn't a prison here then? No, there was a military garrison, uh, a few hundred soldiers strong, certainly, in, in its heyday. And uh, the prisons were built for the arrival of the man in the Iron Mask in, in 1687. Yes, yeah, specifically his for his arrival. Which suggests then that he was quite an important guy. Whoever well, you, you, you can read it uh, that way. Certainly, we don't have the answer, but uh, they were built to his specifications. And this feels like nothing has changed here <laughs> for 300 years. No, it's, it's almost in a pristine state. Uh, this is the way the man in the Iron Mask would have seen certainly the, the fort in those days. So, would there have been musketeers stationed here? Yes, uh, Samar, uh, the Iron Mask's custodian, brought with him a troop of musketeers. To here? Yeah. So when does he first arrive here? He arrives here on the 30th of April, 1687, uh, coming from the Italian Alps, his preceding uh, prison, uh, the Fort of Exile. Okay. And would it have been common for prisoners to have worn Iron Masks? I don't think that common. I mean, we, we, we have no trace of any other prisoner uh, having an iron or, or other uh, velvet mask. Right. And, I mean, it strikes me the only reason why he would have been forced to wear a mask would have been to conceal his identity, right? Yeah, it's probably not a punishment of any kind. It's, it's really to hide his face. And why, why, would it be, why would it have been so important to conceal his true identity? Well, that's, that's really a matter of speculation. Again, who is the most recognizable figure in the land? Um, probably the king. Uh, therefore, it's sprouted a lot of theories about the identity of the Iron Mask in relation to the king. Because people aren't going to know, people aren't going to recognize, you know, there's no TV, there's no magazines, people aren't going to recognize. That's right. The, the most recognizable he... face is, is that of the king. It's on uh, all the, the coins uh, any peasant in the realm would have had in his pocket. So was the prisoner kept on this island the twin brother of the king? Why was he given such elaborate conditions? A jail cell on a private island away from the prying eyes of all but his guards. And why was he said to have been visited by King Louis XIV's sister-in-law, Elizabeth Charlotte? Afterwards, 
she sent a letter to her aunt Sophia, stating that she'd seen the prisoner in his cell and that he had two musketeers at his side to kill him if he removed his mask. She described him as very devout and that he was well treated and received everything he desired. It does seem that a very great fuss was made over this man, whoever he was. Well, of course, the problem between the twins is that one would have been born before the other and obviously would have been the, the heir to the throne. Uh, but, of course, who would have known which was which? One was probably more contriving than the other. Um, who knows which one? But one, one was locked away in an iron mask. And, of course, the whole idea was that, that he, he wasn't allowed to, to speak to anyone. No one was allowed to speak to him. No one was allowed to see him. Because if that mask came off, then, God forbid, zut alors, c'est le roi, he's the king. And the poor lad spent the rest of his days in darkness. This is the prison? Yes, this is a slightly later addition to the two cells built for the Iron Mask. But these were built uh, during his stay here. This is where it was kept. Yeah, this is the first cell here on the left. So this is this is the cell where he was for how many years was he? Eleven years. Eleven years. square meters. It's uh, very spacious, uh, nice height under the ceiling, yeah. um, with a lot of commodities for the day. Sure. Behind you, there's a chimney, a latrine, right, uh, and this big window. Nice view of Cannes. Uh, in those days, uh, nothing on the other side except perhaps a small fort, but nice, nice view on the sea. Sure. So what do we got? What's this here? These are the latrines. Oh, right, okay. This is where he would have done his business, right? Exactly. Quite comfy. And so what else would have been in here? Would there would have wouldn't have been had any furniture, yeah, I guess, of had some furnishings, we have no idea what it might have been. But judging from the size of the room, the latrines, the fireplace, uh, even if it's a north-facing cell, uh, it's actually probably more comfortable in those days than what the soldiers of the garrison would have had on the side. Is that right? Absolutely. They must have been pretty upset about that. They may be. They may have speculated a little bit about the identity of the mask. So if the prison a uh, cell itself was considered to be quite, I mean, luxurious is probably not the right word. Uh, that, again, would suggest that the prisoner was indeed an important person. It might. I think if we look at the cell built for uh, the Iron Mask to his specifications, you know, this is how they built the cell. Uh, and it does tell you something about uh, the type of prisoner he might be. I have to tell you, that it really brings this incredible story home when you're inside his cell. The first thing that strikes you is how spacious it is. And with the furniture inside, the frescoes on the wall, and the view of the Bay of Cannes, it clearly was designed for someone of some stature and importance. But who? Who do you think the man in the iron mask really was? The big question. Uh, I think the best candidate is a man called Eustache Danger or Danger, um, but we don't know who that man was exactly. What we know is he uh, had some secret, some state secret. He might have seen something or participated in an event uh, which he was uh, sworn to secrecy about under pain of death. But would people have recognized Eustace Danger? No, absolutely not. So why would he have worn a mask? <laughs> I don't know. But, but the, the reason why I say this is because presumably he's wearing a mask to conceal his identity. Yes. And the most famous person at the time, the most recognizable person, would have been the king, Louis XIV. Yeah. The lore of the day, um, propagated by Voltaire and others, uh, suggests that he had a connection to the identity of the king. Somehow the identity of the king plays into this whole, whole affair. So he's been incarcerated because he's a threat to either the dynasty or to the person of the king himself. Whether that's true or not, we just don't know. Is it possible the man in the iron mask could have been related to Louis XIV? It's possible. 
It's not certain, and, and I don't think we'll ever find out, because the people in those days were very uh, cautious, uh, secrecy was uh, very high, and I don't think we'll ever find out the true identity, actually, true identity, the true nature of his, his crime or the reason for his, uh, that, such a punishment. 34 years in prison uh, for something we know nothing about. I think we can say, based on how we know that the man in the iron mask was treated, that the idea that he was a member of the French royal family does make some sense. The comfortable private prison, the royal musketeer guards, and of course, the mask itself. The only point of him being forced to wear it would be that he was instantly recognizable to everyone. And I think Alexander Dumas got it right. I think there's a strong case to be made that he was in fact the twin of King Louis XIV. This is Can here, right? Yeah, about a mile away. Okay. Yeah, there was no way he was going to escape. From no, here, not a it? chance. And this is his cell at the far end there? Yeah, it's the very last uh, window in the main building. Okay. Would, would he have been able to communicate with the other prisoners? Or? No, probably not. Uh, the legend is that he did try uh, at one point to communicate with the outside world uh, by throwing a, a silver dish where he'd inscribed his, his name, his true identity. And this dish was recuperated, so the legend says, by a, a fisherman who promptly brought it back to the governor of the fort and uh, who asked him if he could read uh, what was written on it. And having ascertained he couldn't read, uh, then the, the dish was kept. Right, so that spared and, uh, his life. <laughs> the mystery was, yeah, it spared his life and the mystery was, was saved as well. So as King Louis XIV's brother, you know, the king is going to treat him well, right? He's not going to kill him. It's his brother. He doesn't, you know, hate him. He just, he wanted the throne. So he's kept in isolation and has to wear a mask. because so nobody can see who this guy is. Because they would say, hey, you're the king's brother. You're the rightful heir to the throne, aren't you? So he had to be kind of kept a little bit out of view. On September the 18th, 1698, St. Mars was transferred once again, this time becoming governor of the Bastille in Paris. And once more, he brought his masked prisoner with him. Now, there's nothing left of the infamous Bastille jail, which stood on this very site for centuries. But according to eyewitness reports from the time, there was a prisoner kept in isolation under heavy security. And yes, he did wear an iron mask. He's said to have died on November the 19th, 1703, after nearly 40 years in prison. A skeleton was found in his cell, its skull still ensconced in an iron mask. In 1789, when they uh, stormed the Bastille at the beginning of the French Revolution, they were obviously tearing through the building, and they went to one of the deepest, darkest dungeons, opening various doors, and inside this rather small cell, still chained to the wall with the remains of a skeleton wearing, would you believe, an iron mask. Ironically, the iron mask made the prisoner even more noticeable. I mean, no one stands out in a prison unless you're a raving lunatic, but this chap did. He had a mask on, and, and, and there's many historical accounts of him being, him being seen in this prison or that prison or on this boat on his way to a, another prison. Voltaire mentions that he was seen in the Bastille wearing this iron mask. So it really led to the creation of the legend in the first place. It's very sketchy who he really was, but there are reports of people entering his cell, taking off the hats, bowing to him, and of course, uh, Benign Dauvern actually referring to him as my prince. So what little evidence there is leads to some form of royal personage. One question had been bugging me. What was it like to actually wear an iron mask? What did it feel like? 
Presumably, it was like putting your face into a prison cell. It would have been uncomfortable and hard to see, hear, or even eat with. My French producer, Eduardo Flaherty, was happy to help me find out and had arranged for a blacksmith, Olivier Feno, three hours outside Paris to make one using the same tools and methods from the 17th century. This guy is one of the most famous blacksmiths of the whole region. He builds you know, amazing works of art. Right, and sure. he's agreed to make a mask like a mask made in the 17th or 18th century. Right, okay. And he's just absolutely extraordinary. It's really, really good. Bonjour. Aha. <laughs> Now he's heating it up one more time. And he plays side to it, Matt. Now, this is really a mask that the people, the prisoners, are almost to the port, right? It's a cage. It's a cage for the... For a prisoner, oui. It's a cage. <laughs> they were just blocked in there. And, and, Olivier, where did you get the design for this mask? Where did you find the design for this mask? My him. Right. In his head. <laughs> so you're a prisoner. You're re reincarnated in the prisoner. Sure. Okay, watch out, watch out. He's going to... In the water. Whoa, here we go. Wow. It's hot, it's hot. Ooh. So here he's putting the last touches of making it a bit round, a bit more solid. Mais ça faisait combien de heures? Environ une trentaine d'heures. 30 hours of work to put this mask on. 30 hours to make that. Chaque partie, chaque pièce a été chauffée. Yeah. Every single piece had to be heated, molded, sculpted, put together. Uh, sure. Wow. And, and I'm guessing he's never had to make anything like this before. Est-ce que tu as jamais fait un masque dans ta vie? Jamais. Never done this. Attention. Okay. Ah, tu fais ça. Oh, oh. Whoa. Est-ce que Jamie peut toucher? Wait, tu peux toucher? Well, is it hot? No. <laughs> Why, Jamie? Put it on. Oh, yeah. Can I hold it? Mm. Is it is the <laughs> the mask? Uh, yeah. Wow, that's really heavy. Wow, that is amazing. And so this is the kind of thing that the prisoner would have would have worn. So prisoner, Debbie Portier mask or something, right? Oui, donc le fameux prisonnier de la Bastille Saint Marguerite, le protéin masque. Chaque fois les sorties en public, le protéin masque plus ou moins pareil pour cacher sa tête. Voilà. Et dans la pénombre, on voit pas son visage dans le noir. Oui, oui. Pendant des années. Olivier told us that it took him over 30 hours of work to fashion this iron mask, and frankly, it looks terrifying. And to hold it in your hands really brings this whole shameful story to life. To think that a real prisoner wore a mask like this for nearly four decades inside a prison cell is a sobering thought. It must have been a living hell. Hmm. <laughs> I'm not sure it fits. Oui. It's on my large head. Like this? Ça y est. Oui. If it goes on. Oui. Is it gonna? Wow. Oh, 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 oh! Super, tu l'as mis bien. Wow, <laughs> that is horrific. Is it super cut? Oh, yeah. oh, okay, go on. <laughs> In here? Oui. C'est difficile de. Oh, the door. Really, so now it can't come off. No. Oh, great. That is really, really uncomfortable. Ouch. And so heavy. I can't, 
imagine spending a day in this, let alone four decades. Mm -hmm. That is horrible. I really want to get this off now. Can you get it off for me? <laughs> Seriously, it's horrible. <laughs> Oh, that was horrific. Whoever came up with this is a very cruel man indeed. That is horrific. To wear that thing for more than just a few moments would have been very, very uncomfortable, painful, difficult. It restricts your hearing, it restricts your vision. Wearing this mask, which must have weighed three or four kilograms, then the prisoner would have been lucky to survive for a year wearing the thing, and not for more than three decades. If it's true that he was forced to wear a mask like this at all times, the most logical conclusion is that the man was instantly recognizable or had a very obvious resemblance to another person, most likely the king. That he was the twin brother of Louis XIV, as Alexander Dumas says, is by far the most likely scenario. And not able to actually kill his brother, he was removed from court and imprisoned to a life behind bars. If this is true, then the whole thing is, is, is the most tragic tale. Um, someone of, of royal blood actually locked, not only locked away, but tortured, terribly tortured with this, this heavy mask on, it, on his face um, and lasting 32 years in, in, a, in a dreadful prison cell that when his jailer came in, they always took off their hats and bowed to him. The story of the man in the iron mask fascinates us because it's a great conspiracy story. And it's got all the intrigue of and the mystery of who was this man in the mask? Was he a mask royal? And all the different mysteries attached to it. And the legend has grown over time because of that. We love a good mystery as human beings, don't we? I believe the man in the iron mask was a real historical figure, not a work of fiction. The question is, who was he? And there's two or three really good candidates. I'm not sure we'll ever know. Everything points to the hand of power coming down from the monarchy, coming down through Richelieu and going, we are going to take control of this man right up to beyond his last breath. He is, without doubt, one of the most famous prisoners of all time. But is it possible to say who he really was? For me, it's the nature of his imprisonment, the isolation, the high level of security, and, of course, the Iron Mask, that suggests that it was vital that his identity was kept secret. So the theory that he was Louis XIV's brother seems to make a lot of sense. An older brother, a legitimate heir, brutally airbrushed from history. I'll see you next time.